All right. Um, welcome, Mr. Lynch. Do you have anything you want to tell us to start no. off? No, I have no prepared speech, so I'm good. <laughs> Okay, um, uh, my friend and uh, fellow book club admin team member, Jake Billingham um, from the UK, he has our first question for you. Jake, Jill, can we unmute Jake? Oh, were you, I thought we were, oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> um, gotcha, okay, got it. You go. Maybe you could tax me, Joanna, so I can be prepared. Okay. I, I don't, I don't, you didn't send me the list. <laughs> All right, go for it. <laughs> Hi, Don. Um, the first question is from Tyler Finlater, uh, who lives in Ottawa, uh, Canada. Uh, he has two questions. Um, so we'll ask the first question, then you can answer, and then I'll answer, uh, ask the second question. Um, how did you get involved with Titanic? Well, um, going way back, I think I was always interested um, I remember seeing the 1953 movie as a child on TV and it was very exciting. And, um, but until um, actually the Poseidon Adventure came along and saw it and enjoyed it um, on the big screen. I think it plays well on the small screen. And so I thought, well, gosh, I wonder what real shipwrecks are about. So I checked some books out of the library and one of them was A Night to Remember and that just hooked me and that was it. Amazing. And the second question is, have you ever been to Belfast? Yeah, many times. Well, I don't know if you, many, many times, but um, the Titanic Heritage Tours used to go there back in the 1990s when all the buildings were still there, most of the buildings that were original. And then I've been there once since the new attraction has been open and, you know, check that out, saw the nomadic again, everything. So, um, but I, you know, my opinion is I enjoyed the attraction, but, I wish they had, instead of tearing down the old buildings and putting up a new one, they had utilized the original buildings in creating a museum and an attraction. I think that would have been more valuable or interesting to tourists, but that's my opinion and they didn't ask me. Okay, who is number two, Joanna? Who's the next on the list? Um, I don't think that we had an assigned um... Yeah. Member for number two, um, did any of you guys have number two? I'll just do it, why not? Um, this question comes from Thomas Humphrey. This is kind of a random question. Um, Thomas uh, wants to know, do you remember him from the very first Titanic Heritage Tour back in September of 1993? Was that a memorable I'm gonna, one? <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna say, I believe I do. I recognize the name and I believe I know who that is. Oh, okay. So, hi, Tom. Oh, that'll make him happy. <laughs> Thank you. Was that a memorable um, experience, the very first Titanic Heritage Tour? Oh, it, it really was. It was because being the first, you know, we enjoyed it tremendously. Um, there was a lot of camaraderie on the coach and just seeing these places for many people, seeing them for the very first time. And it was really exciting. We had a lot of fun. Awesome. All right. Um, Jill, Next I person think is uh, Nick. Is Nick? Are you here? <clears throat> Wait, let's. Uh, we also gotta we gotta unmute him. I don't. Is Nick here? Yeah, I saw him on there a second ago. Bear with us, y'all. <laughs> I see Nick. Do it. We got a second ago. Oh well, let's. Um, Nick, do you want to ask your question since you're here? <laughs> I'm gonna get you all on. Sorry, this is our this is our very first time. I'm gonna unmute Nicholas to it because he this is his question. Do you remember your question or? Yeah, I actually looked it up just to make sure that I. Okay. Had. <laughs> um, Mr. Lynch, what do you think can or will be accomplished by the next generation of Titanic historians that are that are coming up now? Well, I think there's more out there to be discovered. I think is. Um, you know, more information that comes to light in newspaper archives that are being put online, things like that. And I think technology, um, not just in research, but in studying the wreck will probably advance. And maybe there will be a way someday of studying the wreck more intensively than we do now without actually disturbing it, um, doing different, um, what do you want to call it? Um, but just, you know, reenactments, I guess you could say in a way, you know, online in some way. 
um, of how it broke apart and sank based upon where the debris landed. Um, you know, I'm sorry that a lot of the um, artifacts were picked up without really good um, documentation of where they came from because that helps. But I think through studying the wreck with new technology and I think through doing research, uh, things still come to light. You know, we still find an account by a survivor from time to time that some family has that they never released. People come forward with information. So I think there's still more to be learned. I think there's a lot for the next generation to do. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Right, let's, um, Douglas, do you remember your question? Because we have a question for you. I'm going to un Douglas Roth. I'm going to un unmute you. Douglas, you're on. Hey, John, can you hear me? Yes, it's a can little it's me? a little glitchy. Can you hear him, Don? Yeah, kind of comes comes in and out, but give it a try. How you do? I I always say, but now you can see my face. Oh. My question is: uh, Do you think Captain proactive life boat situation, or do you think not proactive? Okay, I didn't really get that. Can you repeat that, Doug Douglas? Oh, actually, I have his question right here. He said, do you, like think Captain, do you think Captain Smith was proactive during the lifeboat situation? Or do you think he was not proactive? And what evidence do you have possibly to back that up? Well, um, off the top of my head, and I know it's uh, not the best witness, but you know, Charles Bleitoller did sort of talk about how he had to go sort of to Captain Smith and say, should I uncover the lifeboats? You know, should I load them with women and children, this sort of thing. And so I, I've always had the impression that Captain Smith was not as proactive as he could have been. I know other people have argued with me, and it's possible that he became more proactive as the night went on. But in general, I don't think he lived up quite to the task that he should have. Oh, thank you so much for that. Elena, you are up next. Let me unmute you. Do you remember your question? I do not. Okay, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read Elena's question, and I'm gonna. Thank you. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> oh no, it's fine. Actually, when the admins were going, we didn't we we didn't switch gears quick enough with the um, the Zoom, but I think we're all doing good. Don's hang, handling it. Elena is from Hamilton, Ontario. Somebody needs to be muted. I don't know who that is. Um, Don, first of all, I want to say thanks. This book has been one of my most coveted books since the first time I saw it in the store when I was eight years old. How did you come up with the concept of such an iconic book? Did you um, I did not come up with the concept. Actually, um, Ken Marshall did, and he went to Madison Press, who had done Robert Ballard's book, and suggested that maybe a more comprehensive book should be done, something that started you know, before the Titanic even sailed all the way through to the end. And they said, no, pretty much, you know, Ballard's book was a bestseller and it's been done and all this and that. And they weren't originally interested. And then they would go to these publishing conventions and other publishers would say, well, when are you doing your next book? And so they came back and acted like it was their idea um, even though it was really Ken's. And so, you know, I got to give Ken credit, you know, for coming up with it and for these other publishers for pressuring Madison Press into wanting to do it. And that's how it came to be. Oh, and I know I could speak for many of us that we just love it. And especially, you know, the images and your information. She's got another part to this. She okay. said, did you, did you know it was going to become what it did when you were putting it together? Or was it a labor of love? Well, it was a labor of love. Um, we did not know it would take off the way it did. And, you know, we were pleased with how well it sold, of course, but really the movie was what really pushed the sales. So um, for a book that was, you know, five years old to suddenly hit the New York Times bestseller list was pretty exciting for us. Um, you know, we wanted a good book out there, but I didn't ever think it would be, you know, I, obviously I couldn't foresee that it was going to be the big seller that it eventually was. Yeah, I think it was my first purchase when I started studying Titanic. <laughs> oh, it, oh, yeah. All right. Our next question is from Matthew Vander Schilden. I don't see him in here. 
um, he says he's from the Netherlands. And he said, I always wondered how Don experienced seeing the movie and set of Titanic for the first time. And if he has some nice antidotes about his time on the set. Well, um, you know, it was exciting, obviously, to go down there. The, the very first time I went down there, um, you know, I wandered around the sets and everything. And it was really exciting. I mean, just the, the thing I remember most from that first visit is seeing the grand staircase and then, you know, descending it and turning around, running back up again and, you know, descending it again and, and seeing the dining room and walking into it. And it was all set and laid out. And I didn't realize they're going to be filming the dining room scene that night. And so just, you know, and I walked in and I looked around and I thought, I wonder where the Strausses sat and I wonder where the Clarks sat. And I had to remind myself I wasn't really there. This wasn't the real dining room. And anyway, I was back out in the reception room and all of a sudden a bell went off and then all the extras for the filming started pouring into the reception room and walking into the dining room to take their places. And I just thought, oh my gosh, the passengers were arriving for dinner because everyone was in costume. They all looked wonderful and the set was complete. I mean, you know, all the walls, the ceiling, everything were there. It wasn't like a TV set where, you know, the audience sits off to one side and you don't see that side of the room. And it really was phenomenal. And, you know, I, I do have a bunch of anecdotes from visiting the set, you know, one of which I don't want to share. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Jim Cameron told Ken and me, you know, you guys have the run of the studio. He said, all you can do is you cannot stand under a crane or in front of a moving vehicle. That's all. And so we really did get to go everywhere and, you know, see all kinds of things. But um, just, you know, visiting with the other extras, the people working on it, getting a lot of that background. I mean, I, I have story after story of working on the movie. Um, a lot of the, the people you see were actually mannequins. They were dummies oh. and they were padded. And so that way, you know, if anything happened, if people came sliding down the deck into somebody, they would actually be sliding into a padded dummy so they wouldn't hurt somebody. Um, Cause Jim, of course, was very, very concerned about safety. And one time I was down there and to get up onto the deck of the Titanic, you had to take an elevator up to the center because all the rooms were on sound stages. They weren't inside the big ship. And so to walk around, you had to get up there and I wanted to go up on the ship, but it was starting to rain a little bit and they weren't filming that day. And so I had the elevator door opened and it was just stacked with bodies. They were taking all of these mannequins off. And so, you know, I helped unload the elevator and it was just creepy to pick up a body. And because they had these articulated skeletons so that they could be positioned and moved, you could feel the bones when you pick them up, like you could lift them in the armpit, you'd feel the joint under their shoulder there. And it was just kind of creepy to be unloading bodies off an elevator so that I could go up and walk on the decks of the Titanic. And of course, the workers who were there doing it, you know, they were, you know, local guys. And they were dancing with some of them and talking about how ugly these women were and things like that. And they were just having fun, you know, taking the bodies and then stacking them or whatever. And, and even up on the ship, they hadn't gotten all of them. And there were some that were just wrapped in big trash bags. And it was just odd to see bodies laying around. But, you know, I had a, a lot of fun stories like that that, you know, I, I really enjoyed. And another one that I thought was kind of fun um, was... Um, I was talking to one of the extras and it came up that they had some dogs, you know, in the movie, which you've seen, obviously. And one of them was a French bulldog, which, you know, they had actually filmed the scene, this guy explained, of the dog swimming in the water. And he said that dog was so well trained when they gave the command, that dog just came swimming across the tank. And so later I met the dog trainer and I commented to her, I said, you know, you're um, that, you know, nice French bulldog. And she said, oh, you really know dogs? And I said, no, I know Jim Cameron. And he wasn't going to put any bulldog in the movie. It was going to be a French bulldog. And I said, and I hear it's incredibly well trained because when they would give the command, the dog would just start rocketing across the water, swimming, you know. And she said, oh no, there was a scuba diver underneath him holding him up and swimming. He was just being pulled along, that's all. And so and it ended up, she ended up moving in with that a scuba diver later. But so, you know, just cute little stories like that. They were really kind of behind the scenes and that scene didn't even make it into the movie. But, you know, there was a lot of stuff filmed just in case and that was one of them. But. 
I mean, I could go on for days just about the movie, but I, I won't, I won't take up all your time with that. <laughs> we could listen to you all day. <laughs> I don't think we would mind at all. <laughs> All right, Dave Gardner, I'm going to unmute you because it is your turn. And if you don't remember your question, I can mm -hmm. ask it for you. You're on the floor, Dave. Hey, Dave. Hello, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Don. And uh, first of all, Don, thank you for your time. Very much appreciate that. And wonderful to have met you at the convention and whatnot. And just uh, yes. great to hear your, your comments. And thank you, of course, for your book. Very thank fantastic. You. You're very welcome. <laughs> thank you. Now, this question, you won't be held to it, of course. <laughs> and it's, um, we may never know. And your book diplomatically seems to carefully skirt around the issue, saying only that there is an issue, I think. <laughs> but I was wondering if you were of the opinion that uh, second office, uh, that first officer Murdoch did himself in. Well, you know, initially I wanted to say no. And a good friend of mine made a point. He said, why would he? All he had to do was wait 10 minutes. And then, you know, um, George Behe, you know, has done so much research on that and just come up with so many different people who witnessed, you know, and claimed an officer shot himself. And, you know, early and not just newspaper accounts from later, but these were people who had said so on the Carpathia before reporters even got to them, that I don't want to believe that Murdoch shot himself, but it seems very, very possible that he or possibly Wilde actually did. And so I, I don't want to argue that it never happened. I, I used to argue, um, you know, when, when the movie came out, and of course, Jim put it in the movie, and um, it was funny because the people in Dalbiti, the local people there contacted me, and they apparently had contacted Fox Studios and you know the PR people at Fox said, well, Mr. Lynch was the historian, it's his fault, it's in the movie. And, you know, so they contacted me and I said, no, you know, I told Jim at that time I didn't believe that it happened, but it was his right to put it in the movie because I can't prove that it didn't happen. I remember that. And that. so, you know, that, that exonerated me, you know, um, but today, you know, I, I lean more towards the possibility that could very much likely have happened. Wow. Wow, thank you so yeah. much. Um, Ryan, you are on the floor. I'm going to unmute you if Actually, you need um, a John Clifford, I think, is um, on. I don't know if he wants to ask his own question. Say because that again? I, said, I see John Clifford is on. OK. Um, so he might oh. want to ask his question. Oh, good. Otherwise, I'm sure Ryan would be happy to. But yeah, let me. Um, John thank Clifford's you. Line, like down at the bottom of the list. Sorry, guys. I'm gonna unmute you, John. No, I don't have a question for him, but I'm enjoy listening to him. No question. We have one that you put into the. Maybe you put in so long ago you forgot. I can read it. Uh, if he said. Don, I don't, oh, actually it was more of a statement, but it says, Don, I don't know how many times Don was in Belfast. He might've been on two THS sponsored tours. He was at the 1996 THS convention in Belfast, April 10th, 1996, and met several attendees at London Heathrow Airport. And I just wrote, did you want to comment on that at all? Well, I, the, the London Heathrow- Thank you, um, Joanna. Mike Rudd used to put together those tours, you know, the father of Paul Rudd, the actor. And so I would go along and I would go over ahead of time um, to meet with people and help Mike lay out the path and make all the contacts and iron out any details. And then I'd go along on the tour. And, <clears throat> and I, I don't know, I, I'm sure my airfare was paid. I don't remember if my hotel was or anything. And so because Mike did, you know, make it available to me to go affordable, you know, I'd help out. And that's why I was at Heathrow meeting people. Um, when they came off their plane, I'd go and, you know, greet them and help them get to the hotel or whatever. Um, and then, yes, I had been to Belfast these times and to our convention, you know, in Belfast. And that, of course, was back when the Troubles were still active before the truce. And Belfast was a little bit more exciting to be there. Um, <laughs> You know, I, it wasn't like we were in constant danger, but both times we had tours there, we stayed in hotels that had been bombed. And one of them, I think the day before or that morning, 
Um, but you know, usually, you know, before a bombing, they would give a warning because they weren't trying to kill people. They were just trying to destroy buildings because the British government would then have to pay to have them restored. And <clears throat> in fact, the first time I went to Belfast was with Mike and his wife, Gloria. And when we checked in at the Europa, which is the most bombed building in all of Europe, and um, the girl behind the desk was explaining that Belfast was a very safe city apart from the odd bombing and that you could walk around at night and things like that. And then the bellboy was kind of giggling. And he finally said, well, we're in the Guinness book. And he meant because, of course, they've been bombed so many times. But I did find then and, and now that they've had the truce, Belfast is a beautiful, beautiful city. It really is wonderful. And the last time I was there was just about two years ago, I think. And it really is a gorgeous city now, and I'm glad to see it thriving so much because people now can go into downtown, whereas before I think they were kind of afraid to. You know, going to a, a mall back then was like going to the airport where you had to go through a metal detector and everything just to go shopping in a shopping mall. And that just isn't the case anymore. And it's, it's much more beautiful now and more active and it's, it's a lovely city. Was that back when you went the first time? Was that back when they kind of didn't really like to talk about Titanic? Because I had heard that they were a little ashamed about Titanic. I'd, I'd always heard that, but I I never found that really to be true. I, I think that was sort of an, a legend that kind of came up because I'd always found that Harlan and Wolf was cooperative going back even to the 1970s when I started research. And, you know, I think the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum, before we ever had heritage tours, they had a traveling Titanic exhibit that went around to, you know, museums around the United States and things. So I, I, I think they were willing to admit by at least the 1970s that yes, the Titanic came from here. I think they acknowledged by that time that it was okay to talk about it, that it was part of their history. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you so much. And thanks for those tidbits. John is really great about knowing, remembering lots of little tidbits. And those oh, yeah. John came on those tours and things back then. He's been to many conventions. Yeah. Yeah. And he just has a great memory. <laughs> okay. Amber, I'm going to up unmute you. Amber is one of our admins and she also runs this great Titanic trivia and uh, gets a lot of members together and they battle. Oh, let's see. Did I get you unmuted, Amber? Yes, I think so. I'm just, I think I'm having a hard time talking because I'm, ex I'm ex really excited to see you, Don, and Thank for you to you. actually, to talk to you. Um, <laughs> you already answered my question, actually. My question was about um, how old were you and um, what brought you to your love of Titanic. But um, I was six when I became interested. Um, and then since, since you already answered my question, I just want to show you that I have your book. <laughs> oh, wait, do we need to spotlight on you, Amber? Hold on. We can spotlight on her. Let's see here. What you want? Okay, oh. here we go. <laughs> here it is. Yeah. Yep. Yay! Beautiful. <laughs> Maybe if Joanne will do that later with her leather edition. Oh yes, I just got the leather edition. The leather. <laughs> oh <copy>. yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't you, know if Amber. I have one of those, but I've seen it. Yeah. You don't have one? Wow. I don't know. I might. I might have it somewhere. You know, they're supposed to give me a copy of everything, but I don't know if I. I, I probably have one. I just haven't seen it in decades. I love it. I got really lucky with that one. So I've been trying to get it for a good while. <laughs> ah, nice. Awesome. All right, let's see. We're going to move on to Ryan. Ryan, oops, I'm going to get Don back on the spotlight. Sorry. Just learning how to spotlight Don. All right, Ryan, I'm going to unmute you because you're next. And if you don't remember your question, I've got it right here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, happy days. Um, hello there, Don. How are you? Good, thank you. Um, there's I'll a, just there's start a Belfast saying, accent for you. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I was just going to say you are completely right. Belfast is a lot less entertaining these days. <laughs> but um, no, also, I just want to say, just before I do ask a question, I do want to just say and just thank you for the contribution you have made to Titanic and the story. Like you know, every, like the amount of work that you have done for Titanic, it's like I grew up on you, you know, like I knew a lot so much of Titanic because of your work and it's an absolute honour to actually speak to you. <laughs> but my question is, um, which Titanic passenger story is the most personal story for you? Well, um, you know, the two survivors I knew the best were Edwina Trout and Ruth Becker. And, you know, so it's hard to choose between the two of them. 
Um, they both had very interesting stories, but I think in some ways it was Edwina Trout because she was older. You know, she was an adult when she sailed on the ship and saw things through an adult's eyes and, you know, didn't just do what she was told. You know, she was responsible for her own actions. And so I, I really think it was Edwina Trout and, and both ladies were wonderful and Edwina was really special. You know, she was one of the kindest, nicest, you know, uh, most angelic people I have ever met. So giving and everything. And, you know, I never met anybody who knew Winnie who didn't love her and for being such a wonderful person. And so I, I def if I had to pick between the two, I'd probably pick her, but it's really hard because both ladies were very, very special to me. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for answering that. Jorge, I'm not sure if you are here. I'm looking. I don't think Jorge's here, but Jorge's from Chile. He's also one of our admin team. And he asks, Don, when you think of Titanic, what's your favorite part of the ship? The one that captures your attention first. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I, I, I probably would have to say today, you know, that it would be the dining room just because, you know, in a sense, I've been there. Um, and that probably, you know, that and the staircase, you know, are what I think of first. And certainly there were many, you know, wonderful rooms on the ship and in all classes, but I just think that one sort of comes to mind first. And just for that very reason that I, I experienced those rooms on the set and, you know, I had a very positive experience there. Oh, thank you so much. Um, who we got next? Richard. Richard, you're on the floor. Do you remember your question? Richard Holmes. Richard's our, uh, he's like our moderator here. Oh, and, uh, yeah, me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I didn't put you on the floor, but I noticed you're next. I, I oh, was trying to, and then trying to remember which question it was. Um, yeah, uh, could you, uh, do, what are your uh, upcoming projects? What are you uh, working on? And uh, what are you, um, uh, yeah, what are you working on? Well, um, nothing Titanic related right now, really. Um, I've been labeling a lot of old photos since I've been at home a lot lately. So I've been going through photographs and labeling them and organizing them and little projects like that. But um, now the only thing Titanic I really do these days is I do give talks around Los Angeles. Um, the Daughters of the American Revolution really love me in this town. And so, you know, the word gets out. And so they all have me over to speak at their luncheons. And obviously, they've had to postpone some. Um, and what I do for them is I do Ladies of the Titanic. And, you know, everybody in the room gets a name. And then I just go around the room and tell them who they were and what about them, you know, usually whether they lived or died, where they were from, what happened to them, and then what happened to them later in life. And even with the ladies on the Titanic, you know, so many ladies in first class had such interesting lives and so many were so accomplished that you can do that and still make it very interesting. And so that's kind of the only activities I got going on these days. That's just about it. It's just going and speaking to different groups and that's it. Nothing really major coming up. Oh, wow. Great. Thank you so much. Our next person is our next question is from Justin, but I believe, I'm not sure if he's here. So Alicia, oh, she said, Justin said, why did you choose to write a book like Titanic and Illustrated History? Well, what else would I write? <laughs> um, you know, that was my major subject of interest. You know, I've been interested in a lot of other topics, but that one was the one that I'd done the most research on. And so, and I think even if we hadn't done illustrated history, I probably would have written something anyway. And so um, it just wouldn't have been as illustrated, but um, just because that was the focus of most of my research and everything that that's why I did would have or, or would have done that book. Oh, it was our book of the month this month. I wasn't sure if yeah. you were aware. <laughs> and it was, yeah. This was very exciting to have you come. And I'm not sure if this Peter Reinhold Cole is here. There's a couple of Peters, but I don't think he said, "Hey, Don, who is your who are your favorite passengers aboard Titanic?" Yeah, well, you know, once again, I um, know you mentioned you know, <laughs> Winnie and Ruth, um, but the ones I knew um, 
and was close to like Edith Brown Haseman from Southampton, um, enjoyed her very much, very sweet lady. I knew Eva Hart very well. And, um, but actually the, for among the ones I never met, probably Harriet Crosby, um, but because I knew her daughter so well. And so as a result, you know, I got to know a lot about Harriet Crosby. And so um, those pretty much the favorite ones. And then, um, you know, among the victims, obviously the Allison story, you know, um, close to me. So um, just, you know, those, those are a handful of them. But if it, you know, again, if you had to pick the top two, it would be Edwina McKenzie and Ruth Becker Blanchard. Yeah, I used to love hearing you talk about Ruth, which just sounded like such a, I just loved hearing her stories. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to. I have to unmute. Joanna, we have she's a. Telling did you me. skip Alicia? Is she still? She told me to skip her, so I just asked Justin's question myself. Okay. Yeah, I, I checked in. All right, Joanna. I don't know how you got muted when you're a co-host, but I think you're unmuted now. I muted myself, and then I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Technical on problems. The, floor. Um, then, the reason I did that was because I went to get my books. Um, Mr. Lynch, I absolutely love this book. A friend of mine gave it to me. And wait, um, do I need to? I need to spotlight you. Are you showing? Uh, no, you don't need to spotlight. Oh, me. okay. No, I didn't know if you. I didn't know if you. I absolutely love Ghost of the Abyss. Thank um, you. I. We did an interview a while back that's going to be reissued in our newsletter, and um, when I was trying to come up with questions, um, my partner Jake Billingham and I, um, I reread re -read a lot of this book. Um, and it was just truly fascinating. Um, I loved your the way you described what happened on 9-11. It was such a horrible time in our history. Um, but you know, you guys were at the site of another tragedy while another tragedy was happening. And um, that what you wrote about it just really spoke to me. Um, what what was it like, you know, being in there at that time in our nation's history and our world history, really? Um, and what can you tell us about that particular expedition that you were on? Well, um, again, you know, a lot of stories about that expedition. I, uh, when we first went out there, because we were really going to explore the interior like it had never been explored before. And the only thing I could liken it to was the movie King Kong. Um, because, you know, in King Kong, they're on this ship going to this island to seek this this creature that they've heard about, but no one has seen. And so that's kind of what we were doing. We were going in search of something that nobody alive or very few people alive at that time had ever seen. And so, um, and certainly first class and the crew were all gone, which was most of the areas that we you know, explored. And so we were really going out there to seek the unknown. And so it was very, very exciting. And we were thrilled with what we found inside the ship, that there was so much intact, everything. Um, it was really fantastic and um, exciting for me, you know, obviously to go down to the ship and to see it um, with my own eyes and kind of see the places that these people I had known had talked about. And that was exciting. And, and I, I was really pleased the first time I saw the ship because we kind of came up to the side of it and we were rising up the side and Ken, you know, knows the ship, whereas I have studied the story and rising up the side of the ship, even though it was just through a little porthole, I knew exactly where I was and I realized I knew the ship better than I ever thought I did. Wow. And that, that was really um, kind of exciting for me to realize that I knew that so well and I knew where I was. I wasn't just looking at something that could be the Titanic. I really did recognize, and I recognized when we were passing the Strauss's room and that sort of thing. And then, um, but 9-11, uh, you know, I think we, everybody who remembers it, you know, just remembers the horror of it. And we didn't get to see it play out at all. It was all done and over when we were, you know, out there. And, and it was just hard for us to be so far from home. You know, you want to be in your own home in a crisis. And obviously we couldn't get there. And, you know, we considered, Ken and I even talked about how we could get home because we, you know, at that point the expedition was supposed to end and they were gonna go do a separate Bismarck portion and now they couldn't, they couldn't get the Bismarck people out to the ship, um, you know, and we finally decided, you know, 
we have beds, you know, here on the Keldish. All these other travelers here in St. John's do not. I mean, you know, the hotels were full. They had mattresses in the hallways and the banquet rooms to get people to, for people to sleep on. And, you know, signs up that said, you know, lunch will be served from what, 12 to 1.30 and museums were open for free. So people would have something to do while they were stranded in these towns. And so we at least, you know, had a room, you know, and beds on the Keldish and we finally decided we would just go back out. And we actually got more exploring done and the best exploration done after we went back out. So in a way, you know, that, you know, I don't want to call it a blessing, but as a result of the horrible tragedy, the Ghosts of the Abyss expedition was better for it. But um, when we did finally leave, we went to Halifax instead of St. John, because of course, Nova Scotia is part of the mainland. And so, you know, if anything else, you could have taken a train, but about that time they were opening up the airports and flights and everything. But it was so strange to approach Halifax because the Canadian Navy and Coast Guard sent out a helicopter and some ships and things to kind of escort us in. And we realized, you know, here we're a Russian ship and, you know, we've only got like two Canadians on board. You know, we're all different nationalities and they're these, you know, vessels and the helicopter, they're not greeting us, you know, they're, you know, we're refugees in a way and they're protecting Canada from us just in case. And that was a very odd feeling to actually feel like a refugee. And I, I've always felt a close affinity to Canada because my father's family on his mother's side was from Canada and my mother grew up in Canada. And so, you know, I've always felt very close to Canada and here I was coming into a harbor in Canada and being treated like I was a risk because I was a foreigner and these were difficult times and everything. And it was a very strange feeling. Wow, kind of like oh, now. Thank you. thank you for writing this book. Um, I feel like this is as close as I'm ever gonna get to see the wreck and well, your words are so descriptive and the photos are just absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I have to say, I, I'm very, very happy with Ghosts of the Abyss visually um, because I love then and now. And I think Ken did a fantastic job yes. of cleaning up a lot of the images so you can see them more clearly and then finding comparable images from the period to compare them to. And he did a wonderful job. I, I really am very, very, I wanna say proud, but I'm proud not just for my contribution, I'm proud for Ken's contribution. I guess I could say I'm, I'm proud that I was part of the book Ghosts of the Abyss yes. because I do think that is a wonderful book. And I, I'm, I'm pleased that I was to be a part of that because Ken did a fantastic job. I think visually it's really stunning. And really exactly. great when you put your 3D glasses on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have the 3D <laughs> version too. I couldn't yeah. find it that quickly, but I do have the 3D version with the with the glasses. And I that's love it. Cool. <laughs> really brings it to life. Like when I saw <laughs> IMAX, I saw the Ghost of Abyss movie at IMAX. Oh yeah, wow. yeah. The, the Ghost of the Abyss um, documentary. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen that. It's um, I've memorized good portions of it. It's. <laughs> oh, thank you. You all did a, a fantastic job. Um, the whole team that that put that together um, and even 20 years later um, that's on Disney plus now you guys can catch Don Lynch on there that's a fascinating show as well wow. I've seen that quite a few times I made my children sit through that a few times too <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome we're raising the next generation <laughs> uh, thank you Joanna oh, Don thank you so much for taking the great time with that um we're opening it up now people want to raise their hand if you can't find the little raise your hand button you can just wave in your video and we'll look for you but we've got bruno from brazil on the floor and he likes the uh, the spotlight also because he has something to show you don so i'm gonna unmute bruno hey. hello don how are you pleased Good. to meet you yeah likewise <laughs> uh, i would like to to tell you uh firstly to thank you uh, because um, you helped me a lot mm -hmm. writing my own book. I'm a Titanic author right now. Okay. This is my book, Faces of the Titanic. Yes, excellent. Yes. Congratulations. This photo actually you uh, provided to me. Oh, okay. Kate okay. <laughs> uh -huh. And I have something to show you. One of the pictures of you I put on the book. With oh, Frank oh look at the size of it. Oh my gosh. Yes, yeah, so yeah, if you're on the book uh, and it's it's just a pleasure, you know, to, to um, put um, your inf the info provided to me. Uh, oh, thank you. For my book. Uh, I actually have a question as well about Titanic and Illustrated History. I also have the book. Okay. <laughs> um, 
because I am a, a passenger and crew researcher, I'm most mostly interested about their stories. One of the stories that it, it's in your book that I would like um, for you to, to explain to us is about Alice Cleaver, because in the book you said she uh, killed her own child, but then later I read something about that she didn't actually do it, it was somebody else. Uh, what's the real story about this, about the well, Alice Cleaver? Uh, the real story is, is that I made a mistake. Um, there were two Alice Cleavers in London, the same age at the same time, and I got them confused. And so um, the one of them, and it, the ir irony is, is that, you know, both of them, if you put them okay. in a bad situation with a baby, they reacted badly. And yes, so right. the, the one lady did, you know, have a child out of wedlock and she ended up throwing it off a train to get rid of it and killing it. Um, and the Alice Cleaver on the Titanic, um, of course, when the ship is sinking, she ran off with the Allison baby. And as a result, uh, Mrs. Allison, you know, I believe wouldn't leave the ship without knowing what happened to her baby. And she wasn't going to be separated from a little girl too. And so as a result, she and her daughter were lost with the Titanic when they could very well have been saved. And so I did get those two ladies confused. And so as a result, I mean, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that it was put in there because of course the Alice Cleaver from the Titanic, her family, you know, was very upset. Um, but, you know, I, and I won't go into that too much because in some ways they weren't very cooperative about correcting the information. Oh, okay. They just said, well, it's wrong, period. And so I realize now that it is wrong. And, um, but, you know, one of the things I guess you could say that came out of it is that I'm a lot more cynical about um, research. And I've, I've found that now in some cases where people have misidentified other people who were on the Titanic. And yeah. now, and I, I'm being more cynical. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, I need more proof. You know, show me that. An, an example, obviously, is um, the Allison maid, Sarah Daniels. Um, because Encyclopedia Titanica has a Sarah Daniels who was a maid at that time and apparently isn't the Sarah Daniels who was on the Titanic. Oh, and yet okay. we have her, uh, this other woman's biography. And of course, Sarah Daniels is a very common name. And so it's very hard to identify which one is hers. But the evidence shows that it's not the woman that they have on the Encyclopedia Titanica website. So at least today, I'm a little more suspicious. I'm a little more cautious. And I wish I had been that way in 1912. And I really did debate a lot about putting the incident about the baby's murder in the book. And I just felt at the time that the evidence was sufficient. And I realized now I was wrong. Uh, but it was not possible to correct in uh, 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 subsequent editions. Well, it came out fairly late and Madison Press promised that they would. And then Madison Press was sold to a new owner. And oh. that person has made no changes whatsoever to subsequent editions. And in fact, since he took over, I never got a royalty check again. And oh. wow. so, um, you know, and I know other authors with Madison Press have had the same issue. And, uh, you know, we actually contacted an attorney and the attorney said, you know, the way publishing is today, you know, there won't be any money to pay you. Do you want to pay legal fees when you won't get anything in return? And so, you know, we all just kind of backed off and said, well, there's nothing we can do. And I think today it's completely out of print. I don't think there are any new printings of it anyway. But oh, okay. the intent was, with the original owners of Madison Press intended to correct that in future editions. And then I think the owner, the, the primary owner, um, he had health issues, so he sold the company. Okay. Well, uh, Don, I would just like to thank you again for all your uh, kindness in helping me. And, uh, you know, uh, you are an inspiration for aspiring young writers like me. Thank you, so <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate uh, that. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, thank you for that explanation, Don. You. Thank that you. was great. So you don't get commission off of this anymore? I'm trying to sell your book like crazy this morning. Well, you can sell it like crazy. That's fine. <laughs> Knock yourself out. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to, you know, have my name out there because then, you know, I do get involved if some documentary comes along and it looks promising, I maybe get picked up. But um, no, it's, I think it's completely out of print now. I think the only ones you can get are used ones. And in fact, I think even one of the last printings, they didn't even update the printing number in the book. I think oh. they even had it earlier. They just printed more without updating the printing number in the book. That's okay. my opinion. Oh, thank you for that information. So we have 
the last copies or there's some yeah. out there. <laughs> I've seen them on A books if anyone's looking. All right, I am going to unmute Ryan in Belfast. He's got a question for you. Go ahead, Ryan. Hello, and then uh, Michelle and Lee <laughs> Meredith are on the floor. Oh, okay. Um, no, I just wanted to say, um, you had mentioned earlier on um, about what they have done down in Titanic Belfast. And I'm in complete agreement with you, completely, because I was I actually got a private tour, which was done in secret. I wasn't actually meant to be there. Um, whenever before they had actually started doing all of the work. So I got to see everything as it was untouched. Um, because I knew a friend that worked in the shipyard at the time. And there was basically a handover of a key, and there you go, go and have a look. Um, but what they have done, I do think it could have been done a lot better, and they could have there were certain things that they'd done they didn't have to touch. I think a lot of the, as you say, original Adelaide has been taken away from it, unfortunately. And I think a lot of the actual history has been lost because of that. Um, but on the other note as well, do you actually have any plans to come back to Belfast again? I would like to. The last time I was there was actually on a cruise mm -hmm. to the British Isles, which I enjoyed very much and may do again. And if I have the opportunity, I would go back to Belfast. And, and I have to actually say, um, and of course, you know, being Irish and um, the last time I was in Ireland, it was up in that area because uh, my mother's side came from County Monaghan. Um, but um, I, being sequestered at home, even though I get out every day and I take a walk every day, but obviously mm -hmm. I can't go any place. Um, I miss Ireland. I'd love to go back. I, you know, you, yeah. you, when you're trapped at home, you kind of get itchy feet. And the first place that popped into my head was like, damn, I'd love to go back to, you know, Ireland, Northern Ireland, you know, the Republic, either one. I don't care. Love yeah. them both. If, you, if you're ever back, I owe you a pint or two. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Uh, Thank you. There you go. All right. Next up, we have Michelle and Lee Meredith, and we've got Wade on the floor. Let's unmute Michelle and Lee here. Hey, how are you? Let me do a, can we, oh, are they muted? I'm going to spotlight them for a second so you can see. I think you're muted, but let me unmute you. Okay, there we go. Hi, Don. Hi. Uh, first of all, um, Lee uh, Lisa, take the question because it was mine and he wanted to, him and I wanted to thank, uh, thank you for meeting you last year in March at yes. the Queen Mary. Yes. Yes. And, um, uh, look forward to seeing you again sometime, hopefully when all this is pandemic is over with. But my question to you is um, regarding one of the passengers, if you could interview or the crew, if you could uh, go back in time and interview any kind of uh, any of one of the passengers or crew, uh, and, you know, just to just to interview them, to talk to them, who would it be? Oh, my gosh. Um, I, I couldn't even begin to guess um, if if I were to be able to go back. Um, you know, I I part of me I would like to be there to see certain things. Like I would like to know why Ann Isham or Edith Evans didn't get into a boat um, specifically. Right. Um, I don't know that you could do that with an interview. Um, so. Um, I, I really don't know. I'd have to really, really think about that. And I probably couldn't come up with a single name. There are just so many people that, yeah. you know, crew members you'd want to talk to to find out what was going on down below. Right. You know, things like that. Learn more about what was going on in third class. Those people, you know, didn't really document as much. And I, it's just hard to say, but that, that's a great question. But boy, you know, the too <laughs> many. Answers. Yeah, I, um, you know, somebody asked me that question, and I thought, hmm, let me ask him, because like you, it'd be very difficult for me to, to answer, but the person at the top of my head would be Thomas Andrews, mm -hmm. and uh, and then uh, the purser, uh, purser McElroy, I don't know why, and then uh, Captain Smith, but I agree with you, it's really hard, because there are the passengers, and then there's the crew, and so, mm -hmm. and I thought, let me just ask him, and um, I had a funny feeling that you probably wouldn't have a direct answer but um that's that's the kind of question I ask you know anybody who's a yes. big in Titanic but it was it was good seeing you again yes likewise yeah I enjoyed meeting you and Lee as well thank you okay thank take you care all right Wade Sasan I hope I said your name right you're up next and then Anka Tyler and Nicholas and go ahead Wade it's your turn 
Don, nice to meet you here. I just wanted to thank you for all your years of work on the oh. Titanic Historical Society. It's supported. Oh, thank oh. you. And I, you know, I, you were famous to me before you wrote your book because I used to look forward to getting the commutator and reading your column where you would answer people's questions. So you were always the part of the commutator that I would go to first. But I wanted to ask you, now that the commutator is going digital and, you know, all the changes that are happening with the Historical Society, are you excited about the, the future for the society? And are you, are you still pretty involved? I know you're involved with the planning of the new um, event that's going to happen in Branson later this year, but talk a little bit about your work with the society now. Well, um, now um, I basically, well, uh, for starters, um, it looks like um, we probably will postpone the Branson convention. Um, just because, you know, as we move along, we're not anywhere near the end of the pandemic. And we're afraid that some of the venues we were going to show, take people to like the Dolly Parton show or whatever, they may not be fully open because they involve being in close contact with crowds of people. So um, I, you know, Karen is investigating now, you know, the possibility of moving it out just for the sake of the members. And then more people obviously would want to attend if it were much later, I think. Um, but anyway, um, thank you for the comment about the column. I used to enjoy that column. That was before Encyclopedia Titanica and much of the stuff was even online. Um, but these days, um, my involvement with the THS, it's, I'm sort of helping with these conventions and then I do contribute to the commutators still. And I actually have an article coming up in the next issue and it's a collection of people's memories of those who were on the Titanic that are taken from memoirs written by people who knew them back before they even sailed. And so I, I've, you know, had about, you know, six or eight different volumes of people who remembered people who they had known who had been on the Titanic and not, not people alive today necessarily, you know, like I certainly I could talk about people I knew, but these are people who knew them before they sailed and in some cases knew the victims. And so I have an article about that coming up. And, and Karen is always looking for more articles on different topics. And so anybody who wants to contribute, by all means, let her know. If you've got something, you know, that you can put in the commutator that you think would be of value, tell Karen. You know, she'd appreciate it. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the extent of it. The, the future of the THS, I think, is secure. Ed and Karen and, you know, Ed, Ed, Ed obviously, before he passed away, you know, they made sure that the society would go on if anything happened to them. And so that's the plan is that if anything happens, you know, the society will still exist. There will still be, you know, its archives. Um, I'm not sure whether it'll be housed necessarily, if it'll still have its own little museum because so much of the stuff is displayed in Branson and Pigeon Forge. And so, but it, it will still exist. Um, you know, there is a plan and there's, I think, a team of people who uh, will, will fall into their hands that will take care of things like that. And so I, it, it will not fold, you know, Karen isn't young, I, I'm not either. Um, but, you know, the thing is that right now it, it's continuing even though the magazine is digital and it will continue if Karen gets hit by a bus tomorrow. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, I was trying to, gonna try to get to that convention this fall, but that gives me yeah, more time to, I, gets me more time to save money, so. Yeah, we, we had a lot of people kind of pushing that we postpone it who were feeling uncomfortable about traveling even in September. And I think, you know, Karen finally thought it, it's worth investigating. You know, she was yeah. really being hopeful, but she finally acknowledged that I, I kind of need to look into this and talk to the hotel and to, you know, the different venues in Branson and see what the plans are. And so I think it will be pushed out. Oh, great question. Great answer. Okay, yeah, we've you. got we've got Anka from Germany next. And after Anka, Tyler and Nicholas. Anka, I'm going to un oh you're unmuted, Anka. Thank you, Jill. So um, hi Don, thank you for being here, sharing your time with us. Um, I hope you <laughs> it's it's awesome that you're here. And I, I hope you don't mind my bad English sometimes. So actually I have um we are all jealous because you saw her on the seafloor. And um, uh, I want you to ask, so when you first saw her, what part did you, um, so from which side did you come to the wreck and what did you see first? What kind of feeling was that for you? And how do you feel about um, the disappearing of Titanic? So what's about your feelings um, when you hear that she's going back to nature? Well, um... 
first off, um, you know, when August 27th, 2001, the first time I saw the Titanic, and, you know, unlike in all the movies, you know, when the submarine pulls up and there's the bow rising up out of the muck, um, we approached the starboard side. And I was in the same submersible as Jim Cameron, and he just said, Don, there is Titanic. And, you know, looked out and saw the hull, and we started rising up across the side because we came, you know, we, you know, landed on the bottom and then had to kind of, you know, head towards it. And so, and then once we did, you know, we started rising up. And as I said, you know, just the excitement of realizing that I knew where I was. And, you know, we saw the, you know, dining saloon, I think windows and a reception, I guess maybe it was the reception room. And because then as we went up, I realized that the windows here were the Strauss's suite and then Mrs. Cardez's suite. And so I, I knew where I was and I knew who lived be inside those, you know, behind those portholes at the time. And that was just really special to me on, I can't remember which, cause I did dive twice again on 9-11. And on one of the dives, I kept thinking about the survivors because, you know, obviously I was thinking this is where they were and the survivors I knew, the people who I'd studied. And then on the next dive, you know, I can't remember which is, you know, which was which, but then the other dive, I then was thinking about the victims and it's like, oh my gosh, this is where the Strausses stood and this is where the band played. And, you know, here's the bridge where, you know, Captain Smith was seen, whatever. And so each, the survivors and the victims each got their due, you know, on each of my dives. Um, and as for the wreck today, I don't believe it's decaying. I know the upper decks are, you know, there's no doubt about it. And they were decaying then. And even in 2001, the, the, from the time they found it 15, 16 years earlier to then, there had been a tremendous amount of decay and you know, holes in the roof that had opened up. The walls of the um, gymnasium were now splayed way open. Um, on the stern, I can't remember if it was, I think it was either, I think it was B deck, it completely collapsed. If you had looked at the stern in 2001, it went from A deck to C deck. It had completely collapsed and they didn't realize that until they got there and they kept trying to get their bearings and then they finally realized, well, we're missing a deck. So we've known for 20 years that the wreck is decaying, but these are the thinner metals up on top. And you know, when we got deep inside, and this is what was so amazing to me was that way down inside the wreck, really not even that far down inside because even on a deck, you could see where someone had set their glass down on the rack with the washstand, walked out of the room and a hundred years later, that glass was still there. And if the furniture is still there and if people are able to set a glass down and have it be there, you know, 90, 100 years later, realistically, the wreck isn't decaying that quickly. It's just the part up at the very top where the metal is thinnest that's the most exposed. It's like a home, you know, the roof leaks before the floors do. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I think, I don't think any of us is going to live long enough to see the wreck be completely gone. That hull alone will be there for hundreds of years. There are wrecks a lot older than the Titanic that had a lot smaller ships and the hull is still down there. And in fact, um, we even saw the videographer, the Russian videographer even showed us on one of the Keldish's expeditions that was unrelated to any of this. They had found a schooner and taken video of it. And they had, um, this is about 1810 or 1820 that this ship had gone down and the hull was still there. And they even found a little box. And when they opened it, unfortunately, a piece of paper floated away. I guess they had a manipulative arm or something, or maybe when they tried to pick oh. it up, it opened. But yeah. you know, things will survive even when the upper decks are gone. The Titanic will be there and there'll be a lot to explore. Sorry, I'm rambling, but you know, I, I think of when you go, like when we went into the bow section and went into Dr. Simpson's office and went into like the fireman's mess room and their stairwell, the bow, the walls are all metal. They're not wood like in the rest of the ship. And so, you know, there'll, there'll be a lot to explore for a long time to come down there. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. This is very touching. Thank you oh, good. very, thank very you. much. All right, Don, it's five. I want to be mindful of your time. We do have nine hands raised, so I don't know well, how you I, feel. We can take a few more. I'm good. You know, okay, just... great. I just want to check in with you. I don't want to just assume that you would... I don't have any appointments outside the house today. So okay. I, I, oh, great. Thank you so much. All right, Tyler, you, where did Tyler, Tyler, is Tyler still here? He, I think he said he had to 
reboot his phone. So I'm going to move on to Nicholas DeWitt and get him all unmuted here. Okay, you're on the floor, Nick. Hi, Don. Uh, obviously, your work and Ken's are so well tied together in the book. Is there is there a painting that Ken has done that you think is like your favorite or do you think is just the most evocative of, of, of them all? Well, um, yes. Um, actually, I should do this. Since I had you guys on the, on the video, let's just do what I have in my home. Um, this one means a lot to me. It's the only one I have. Voila. Um, you know, I think you're all familiar with that one. And that's, and I'm very happy to have that one. That was one of my favorites because um, George Behe is really one of my very best friends in the world. And that was done for the cover of his first book. And then of course it was used in illustrated history. So it meant a lot to that, to me, to be able to buy that from Ken. Um, and so that, you know, was great. One of the ones I actually love, and I didn't realize that it hadn't sold for a while, I think, um, is the one of Boat Five in the foreground and the Carpathia in the background, because that's the happy moment. That's the rescue. You know, the ship sinking, is they're dramatic and they're wonderful. And I know there's, um, there's one that we used in illustrated history, and I think it's one of the starboard boats going down and he actually got a lot of my input um, for that to exactly, you know, which boats would be where at that time. Um, and, you know, which I, I enjoy very much. I, I, I have to say, you know, of course I'm a huge fan of Ken's artwork, all of it. And so, you know, almost every painting, you know, I love, but I always liked, I, I like the one looking down the staircase because I helped a lot with that. And it has the Allison's, you know, coming up the staircase wearing the clothing that we know they were wearing based upon either, you know, Miss Cleaver's description or what they found on Hudson's body. And then, um, but I do like the one of the rescue, the lifeboat with the Carpathia in the background because that one is a happy moment and that one I, I enjoy very much. Oh, great, thank you so much. Thank you, Nicholas, for a great question. Yeah, good question. Yeah, <laughs> Jean, you're up. Are you, are you hey, there, Jean? Hey Don. Uh, oh. First, good afternoon or like whatever time it is there. Um, my question. Did I did I say your name right? Sorry to interrupt. Did yeah, I? Say yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Go for um, it. <laughs> my question is: uh, since Titanic is a subject that constantly changes over time, and you discover documents, even photographs, um, what is the most impressive new discovery made since you first started um, researching Titanic? Well, the biggest discovery was the discovery of the wreck itself. I mean, that's how old I am. You know, I mean, since I started researching, the biggest discovery was the discovery of the wreck. And, you know, that changed everything. And I'm I'm embarrassed that I bought into the story of the ship going down in one piece all those years. And yet, you know, when you read the Senate inquiry and even the British inquiry, so many people saw it breaking into and described it in detail. And yet, you know, I, you know, as we say in America, I drank the Kool-Aid and, you know, went along with them with the ship being in one piece when it went down. And so, you know, I, I think that was the biggest discovery and the biggest change in the story of the sinking. And, you know, the biggest question, you know, was answered, did it break apart or not? And suddenly we didn't have to argue with the survivors anymore. Yeah, I'm sure they were very happy right. to be believed. <laughs> I enjoyed, you. you know, the exploration in 2001 of the interior because that was new, you know, that was groundbreaking. We saw parts we'd never seen before, but. But I think realistically, the finding of the ship had to be the biggest thing since I started researching. Thank you so much. Right. All right, um, Tyler, you're up next. You are unmuted, Tyler. Can you hear us, Tyler? Oh, I don't know if it's... Tyler, I don't think your speaker's working. Tyler is muted. All right, well... 
Wait, yeah, he Tyler. said in chat that he was having problems with his phone. So. Oh, Tyler, if you could text me your question, I'll ask it for you. And we'll move on to Jake Billingham here. Go ahead, Jake. Hi, Don. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for um, spending the time to answer mine and Joanna's questions in our interview with you. Uh, I know we can be a little nosy. <laughs> yeah. um, I just wanted to ask, um, have you um, ever taken a look at the Titanic sisters, you know, Olympic and Britannic, and took something from them and learned something about Titanic that you didn't know? Um, off the top of my head, no. I mean, obviously I have a great deal of interest in, you know, those two ships as well. But um, I don't study the structure of the ship as much as Ken does. And Ken has shared a lot, you know, with mm. me about what he's learned. That would be a good question for him. Because, you know, what we know with the Titanic is that a lot of the things that were incorporated in the Titanic that were different from Olympic were later incorporated into the Britannic and in fact into the Olympic later during a refit. And so um, I, I think one of the things that they, you know, realize now is that it's sort of, if you look at the Olympic, the fact that the kennels were moved to the boat deck on the Olympic, I think it does confirm that the Titanics were on the boat deck. Um, but yeah, there are, you're, you're right though. There are things to be learned from studying the other two ships that will tell you about Titanic but I more study the story and not the mm. ships themselves. Yeah, yeah I, I do love passengers, the, the, the souls that were on Titanic. I think, um, uh, you know, Titanic on and Glory has taken stuff from the two sisters and incorporated it into Titanic. I think they've recently done that uh, with their new Britannic game that's soon coming out. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I just, I wanted to see whether you had ever looked at those two ships and and learned something from the Titanic? Not so. that I can think of offhand. I know when we were exploring, because, you know, of course, Jim went back in 2005 and did more exploration. And it was funny, he was on, I think, Scotland Road, and he went into a room that had a title on the deck plans of something, and I can't remember what, but when he went in there, it was a pantry. It had just stacks and stacks of dishes. And so there are things like that that, you know, we may never know really what if if the plans are accurate for Titanic, because, you know, we go off of Olympics so often. So, but there are things, you know, maybe there'll be more exploration down the road and we'll learn even better things like that. And I know that sounds trivial, but boy, it means a lot to us historians, you know, every room, we got to know what it was. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, next up is Samantha. Hi, Don. Um, Hi. I've just kind of been curious to ask, um, I have severe anxiety. So for me, I know I would be like, uh, nope. Um, were you ever scared about going down to the, the shipwreck? Like when you, when you had the expeditions, was there oh. ever any nervousness? Oh my gosh, yes, of course. Um, you know, I, I, I was very nervous and I wondered if I should even accept the invitation. <laughs> of course, you know, everybody said, well, you know, you're an idiot if you don't, which would have been true. And, but, you know, and I wasn't the only one who was nervous because, you know, Bill Paxton was out there with us and, you know, and he was funny because he was saying how he had told Gloria Stewart that he was going down there and she went, are you crazy? You have <laughs> children, you've got a family, you have no business putting your life at risk. And so he was nervous too. And I thought, well, if this guy who stars in these action movies is nervous, I'm a, I can be nervous too. And I, I, I was really nervous, I, you know, what will happen? And I even said to um, Ed Marsh, one of the guys on the expedition, a wonderful man, and I said, you know, what happens? I've, I've never been claustrophobic in my life. What happens if I get to the bottom of the ocean and I have a panic attack? Oh, and he gosh. said, the Russians keep a really big wrench in the submersible. And obviously what they'll do is they'll just knock you over the head. <laughs> and, you know, so <laughs> that's, and seriously, he goes, that's what will happen. And it's like, Okay, well, that doesn't make me feel better. Um, <laughs> but, you know, what did make me feel better was knowing that if there is any breach in pressure, that the submersible will crush instantly. And so there's no suffering. It's over immediately, which is a comfort, you know, that you're not going to suffer. And then also the fact that I was going down there with Jim Cameron, because Jim is an incredibly competent person and just 
you know, and I even uh, joked afterwards and said, you know, I, I think that if the pilot, you know, had had a heart attack and died, Jim could just push the body to one side, grab the control, <laughs> and he would oh, take us back to the surface just fine after he was through filming. And so anyway, um, what finally happened was the day of my first dive, I got into the submersible and, you know, and I looked around and it's just a seven foot sphere. It's not very big and there's all kinds of equipment. And I just thought, oh, okay, this is where I'm going to be for the rest of the day. And I realized I was just nervous because I didn't even know what the inside of a submersible looked like. And once I oh, was boy. in there and I saw it and I was like, okay, now there's nothing left of the imagination. This is where I'm going to be. And, um, and Ken said, Ken pointed out that it's a little nerve wracking because the condensation will start to trickle down the inside. And he even warned me, he said, wear two pairs of socks with a baggie, a plastic bag between oh, them. My, oh my gosh. That way, if you touch the side, your feet won't get wet because that's just, that'll just be annoying. Wow. And it didn't bother me to see the water trickling because he said, it makes you think it's leaking. And it didn't bother me, but it bothered me to look at the hatch at the top <laughs> because I'd, I'd look at it and I'd think, oh my gosh, that hatch is the only thing between me and certain death. But realistically, the portholes were between me and certain death. You know, I mean, that was it. And so, and then on the next trip, it didn't bother me. The next dive, it didn't even bother me to look at the hatch. I didn't care at that point. But once you're at the bottom of the ocean, you could be at the bottom of a lake. You don't know. Wow. Or you're just, you're looking at silt and you don't know if the surface is 20 feet above you or 12,000 feet. You can't tell. So once you're down there, you know, I, I was good. It was fine. I, I have one more um, thing that I wanted to say. Uh, when I first got the uh, Ghost of the Abyss book, I believe I was in high school, no, middle school or something. And I'm stereo blind, so I can't see in 3D. And oh. I wanted the book so bad. I just, when I saw that it came with glasses, I started crying. And my Aww. teacher goes, what's wrong? I said, I can't read that. And she goes, I'll take care of it. And then she came up like a couple of days later. She's like, hey, you know, there's a documentary and it's not in 3D. I'm like, oh my God, really? <laughs> so I found mm -hmm. it. I think it was on TV one day and I watched it with my uncle and he was like, what is that? What is that? I'm like, Shh, quiet. I'm trying to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so good. I'm well, glad you got to enjoy it. Yeah. I really wanted to say thank you for, I don't know if you had any say in that, but thank you for, you know, you guys making that documentary because that one by far was my favorite one. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, awesome. All right. Tyler would like to try again. I'm going to unmute him and see how Tyler, third going. time. Third time's the charm. Tyler, we're going to spotlight on Tyler. Tyler, can you, we hear you. I see you. Oh. No, Samantha, be... any chance you can read those lips? <laughs> No, I, I don't lip read. I'm sorry. No, I mean, Samantha does. But I oh, might Samantha. Have oh. Yeah, I wonder. I might have to unmute her. Samantha, any chance you could read that? Or? No, not at that angle. <laughs> okay. Tyler, if you look right at the camera. We... Okay. It's too, it's too uh, fuzzy. Oh, too fuzzy. All right. Sorry, Tyler. We tried. All right, Alex. I am going to unmute you now. It is your turn. Uh, Tyler. All right. Is this now. working? Oh, there we go. Oh, do you want me? Is Tyler's working or? Tyler, are you working? No, he's not working. Okay, just try not to push in line here. <laughs> yeah, no, thank I don't, you. I, don't I know. was yeah, gonna okay. say if Tyler can uh, type his question into the chat, we'll try and read it. Yeah, I did mention that to him, but I haven't gotten anything. And all right, anyway, let me just. Don, I know this has been said to the point of cliche, but it is an honor talking to you today, all the way from New Zealand, and. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I've read, like, I've read Illustrated History. I got it as a birthday present from my dad about, two, I think it was 2007. Yeah, 2007, I got the book. Um, it's a lovely book. And, um, you know, your involvement with the Cameron Titanic and Ghost of the Abyss, those were really good. Um, but what, what have I been to ask now? Okay. Um, did you ever do any, like, um, Titanic talks on cruise ships? Like, you just go on a stage and talk about the ship and all that? Uh, no, I haven't. Um... And actually, I just sailed in January on the Astoria, which was the Stockholm, the ship that ran the Andrea Doria. Oh, my God. And the people on board there were very, they, once they found out I was there, they were very excited. And they wanted me to come and speak on, you know, not about the Andrea Doria, but about the Titanic on their other ships. 
Oh, and then, of course, holy. obviously, you know, their cruising came to a halt, so I haven't had a chance to get in touch with them. And so, you know, I may approach them and ask about doing that. They're smaller ships. They don't do very, very huge ships. And okay. I would certainly do it. You know, we tried years ago to get Ruth Blanchard on the QE2. And at that time in the 80s, Kennard felt it was too soon. You know, they wouldn't have her. Um, okay. You know, I'd, I'd be willing, and I just haven't really actively pursued it yet. Oh, that's okay. Um, Cause like um, last year I was on the Queen Elizabeth, uh, the, the modern one we have q uses. uses. Yeah. Um, I actually met one of your guys from Ghost of Abyss. Um, hold on, where's the photo? Peter Devries, your, oh, your cameraman. He was actually on that. Oh, nice. Hold on, hold on. where's my, oh, here he is. Wait, I let know me, if... let, Alex, let me give you the camera. Hold on. Maybe. Okay, hang on. I'm getting good just... at this now. Moving it okay, hold this. on. I don't know if you could see properly through the phone photo, but yeah, that's him next to me. If I can just. Okay. Oh, can... Yeah, there nice. he is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's just in the theater. He um he did like a lovely talk about Ghost of the Abyss, and um he did a very funny impersonation of James Cameron's accent. It's like, like the theater just laughed at that. It was really good, and he held like a really lovely tribute to Bill because you know he's been gone a few years now, and yeah, it, it was a really good presentation of. He did show bits of the film, which I mean I've already seen, and it's really well done. But um, no, it was a it was a nice honor to meet him and all that. Oh, nice. Yeah. Great, yeah, just you. as much as it's an honor talking to you now, it's definitely made my my lockdown, and that's saying something because <laughs> like because like here in New Zealand we're still at level four. I mean, lockdown will sort of be over tomorrow, but things are still going to be like restricted as hell. But uh, yeah, oh, I think so exactly, and same here in Los Angeles. It's going to be restricted for a while. Yeah, yeah New York too. We're all. Yeah, right, so get... I heard yeah this is so nice we can all be together like thank goodness for zoom whoever invented it thank you all right dave gardner you are up and then joanna and john go ahead dave you're unmuted dave oh how to get muted again dave can you okay go ahead yeah sorry don't pause on everybody but i did have another question this is about Edith Course Evans. And do we know which lifeboat she declined to get on? Because I heard it was D for a while, and then somebody said it was four, and then maybe something else. Uh, do we know which ones she stepped away from? Well, the impression I get now is that Edith Evans wanted to get into four, that she tried. And, you know, and let Mrs. Brown go first. And then when she tried to get, you know, over the railing, then she got caught. And so, but the crewman, she said to Mrs. Brown, I'll get in the next boat. And if it was D, there was no next boat. You know, collapsible B was up on top of the officer's quarters. And so, um, and Gracie, Colonel Gracie said he escorted both women to B or to D. Um, but then Colonel Gracie, I think, was afraid to admit that he fell down on the job because if Miss Evans didn't get into a boat, then that was, it reflected on him that he didn't take care of her like he promised. And there was actually a um, second class woman in boat four, and she said she conversed after the sinking with Mrs. Brown in her boat, Carolyn and Brown. which would imply that that was the boat that Carolyn Brown got into, um, mm. Edith's, you know, traveling companion. So... I'm of the opinion that that it was four that she almost got into and then left. And um, Mrs. Four. Axe, third class, she remembered seeing a first class lady leave, you know, not get in and then leave when they when she got into boat four. And so it sounded like, you know, it might have been Edith Evans then leaving, you know, the boat once she didn't get in. So that's that's my opinion is that it was boat four and not collapsible D after all. I think in illustrated history, I probably said D. I'm pretty sure I did oh. um, because I hadn't realized yet that it was a very possibility, strong possibility that it was boat four. Oh, so, okay. Uh, so we go with four as the final answer. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, you Don. All right, John, John Clifford, you are next. Okay. Well, first I'll say again, hello, Don, and uh, my copy of Titanic Illustrated History is a collector's item. All right, let me see if he's yeah. spotlight on John here. Yep, is there it we go. Or got your signature, yours and Ken. So anything happens, some friends of mine are going to fight over it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I will give you credit. Thank you for it was Don and a friend or fellow LA historian who 
shared the story of Walter Clark and how his father constructed a mausoleum at Holly, then it was Hollywood Memorial Cemetery. Now we know it's Hollywood forever, but that was where Walter Clark was gonna be buried, but they neither never found his body or wasn't identified. So Don Lynch who provided that story on that and I appreciate it. And also Don, I'll give credit it was one of your, your stories you told in 1998 about a third, second class passenger, I think it was August Schmidt, was coming to live with his brother from then on and while he attended class but didn't survive. And that inspired a story that I wrote for a role play group and then fashion there. So I want to give Don credit where it's due. And I know what you mean about the stories about being apprehensive. My mom said to me afterward, after the heritage tour and convention, she was glad to hear about the Europa being the most bombed hotel after she knew I stayed there. And she always said, don't go on the um, submersible. She was always worried that I'd be the one that would have trouble. But I did want to thank Don for sharing the Walter Clark story. And have you been in touch with the gentleman who assisted you on that, the tour in 1997? Um, I, who was that? Do you remember? Cause... No, I don't. I, I don't. I remember he, he had us go, we went by the Walter Clark house and he lived nearby and he was- Oh, the, the well, no, the guy on the bus, the coach. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, he, um, because we had, so he's probably just a friend I tapped into and I, if it's who I think it is, yeah, I'm still in touch with him. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he wasn't really a Titanic person. I just needed somebody who didn't pay to be there. <laughs> I needed to put someone to work. And so he agreed that he would, you know, be the leader on the one bus and I think I was on the other. Okay. Thank you. Thank All right, you. Jake, Jake's got his hand up again here. And the spotlight on Jake. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Don. Um, my question is, um, I love the, the untold stories, the ones that don't get told very much, such as, you know, um, uh, such as uh, Margaret Rice and things like that, you know, uh, yes. what particular passenger that you think that doesn't get as much spotlight that you would like to get more, um, more upfront, more told? Well, you know, the, the one that I would love to know more about is J. Montgomery Smart. Um, who was a first class passenger because no one knows where he came from, although I think I've tracked him down, but I, I'm not comfortable that I'm 100% sure yet. But you know, he was someone who lived out of hotels. And so everything he owned was on the Titanic with him. Yes. And if his attorney hadn't been on board, they wouldn't even know that he'd been there. And so um, because his attorney survived and said, well, yeah, the JM Smart on the passenger list was Montgomery Smart, one of my clients. And so um, I would love to know more about him. So his story, now maybe it's not an interesting story, you know, who knows, mm. but we know so little about him, but he's one that I would love to know more about. Yeah. Yes, I find the ones that are untold are the most interesting ones. You know, you know Margaret Rice who lost her, her life with, along with her children. And, yes. you yeah. know, um, such as Arthur John Priest who, was, the, was as we know, know, know now as the unsinkable stoker who yes. you know, only you know went on the Olympic, Titanic, as well as Britannic, as well as other, other ships that also sank. So those ones are the most interesting, I think, more than the ones. Yeah, I think the, the, the survivors who never gave any interview or ever discussed it ever are the ones I'd love to know more about. I would love to know what exactly did they do? Where were they? What happened to them? And, you know, and Arthur Priest kind of one of them. I don't know that he ever gave an interview at all. And I, I just wish there were more from some of them. Some crewmen went home, never spoke about it again. All right, we got Tyler's question text in here. He said, I wanted Don to explain further what he meant when he said that if the Board of Trade blamed White Star, it would cause people to switch to the French and German. I don't remember ever saying that. But uh, the, the issue with the Board of Trade was that they couldn't admit that they had certified a ship that wasn't safe. And so, you know, I think that was why the 
Board of Trade. They should never have been in charge of the British inquiry. Um, and I think that's why they pointed the finger at, you know, the Californian as much as they did. And also, you know, the whole idea that it was just, um, you know, a lot of bad things coming together at once, you know, the, the flat calm, so they couldn't see the foam around the base, you know, the no moon and all that stuff. Um, I don't remember ever saying that the Board of Trade couldn't blame White Star because it would have hurt the shipping company. Um, that would have been the shipping company's problem. So I think the only thing I ever remember saying about the Board of Trade is that they should not have been in charge of the inquiry because they were as much to blame as anybody else. Right. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. All right. I just wanted to give you a couple things from our Facebook. We're live streaming this into the book club. So okay. Caleb Clark, I know you're kind of a passenger person, but he said, I have a question for Don. How many crossings did RMS Olympic make during her career? P.S. I love your work. I'm a huge fan. I love Titanic, too. Um, I don't remember how many it made. Um, obviously, it was disrupted a little bit in the war, um, but I, I really don't remember how many the Olympic made. Now, I know the records are out there about every crossing. I just couldn't tell you how many it was. All right, thank you. Uh, Jerry said, I wanted to pose a question to Don about the pressure at that depth. Do you know what he means? Um, the only thing I know is that somebody said it's like having 17 refrigerators stuck on your big toe. Oh. Um, you know, it's, it's, I couldn't tell you what the per square inch pressure is, but it's, you know, obviously, you know, the, the submersibles are titanium steel spheres because in a sphere, it, and it actually does crush it a little bit. As I was told if you were to take a thread and tie it perfectly taut from, you know, the farthest opposite ends of the sphere, by the time you got to the bottom, it would be dipping a little bit. And so, but I, I don't know what the exact pressure is. All right, thank you so much. Kate Finnegan says, hi, Don. It's been a while hi, since hi. you took us on a Titanic tour. You remember, Kate? Yes, uh, very much. Hi. She said, it's been a while since you took us on a Titanic tour of LA. It's also a while since we were in Hollybrook Cemetery and you found Assistant Surgeon Simpson's Memorial. Your yeah. book is amazing, by the way, regards, Kate. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. And she wants to know when you're coming back to Southampton. Oh, I wish I knew. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Samuel Fontaine would like to know what you think about Thomas Andrews. Well, I obviously have nothing bad to say about Thomas Andrews. Um, I, I think that, you know, he really did try to design the best ship he possibly could. You know, he made a very strong effort to get people into boats. I think what's interesting is, is that the only people who ever saw him were people in first class. It doesn't look like he went into second or third class to try to get people out of their rooms or anything. Um, but that just could be because no one who witnessed it knew who he was, you know, I just don't know. And so I think Thomas Andrews was very much a hero that night. Oh yeah, I think a lot of us. Phil Kleppen said, instead of talking about the sinking of Titanic, you know, he's like, a Titanic expert at the Molly Brown house. He yes, said, I, yeah. I talk about the history of the sinking of Titanic. <laughs> Phil's a great guy. Yeah. He's, he's so nice. He gave me a tour around Denver of all the different things. Shacknack, Shacknack. I always forget that. He took me up to a grave. Oh, oh, yes. Um, how do you say Shadrach, that? Shadrach Gale. Yes. Yes. We went up and there. It's funny. I stayed in that town on the way to um, the 1998 THS convention in Denver oh. and had no idea that, you know, I was a block away from a Titanic grave, or at least a memorial. Yeah, it was really, um, Phil goes up there and helps take care of that whole cemetery. He's oh, that's nice. Yeah, my cousin um, lived in that town when he was at the Colorado School of Mines. Oh, wow. So beautiful up there. All right, one more. Peter Reinhold Kyle said, oh my gosh, my grandfather worked on the Stockholm in the 50s. Oh, wow. Did he <laughs> add the bow? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Those are people who couldn't get in on our Zoom. I guess I don't see any more hands, but I know Joanna had something else. So I thought she could tail end us up unless you wanted to share anything else. Um, I really appreciate you giving us all this time. Yeah, well, um, you're very welcome. It's been a pleasure. It's so nice. Go ahead, Joanna. Do I need to unmute you again? 
Uh oh. Wait, I think I've unmuted her. Okay, go ahead. She's a co thing. She's Can y'all hear me? Yes. And I'm okay. I have like a couple of mini questions. Okay, is this the book that you were talking about? That is yes. the painting that you have? That's it. And that's why the Titanic and the painting is so far to the right, because the left part is the back of the dust jacket. That, yeah. That's awesome. Oh. I know that. that is so cool. There you go. Um, I, have, um, I posted it in the um, book club. Um, I'll have to find it. I bought one book just because it had a Kim Marshall painting on the cover. And it was this one. That's really oh, unique. Oh, right. Rusty's book. Yes. Yeah. I want to read it. I think I think it sounds really interesting, but I was really drawn to it because of the Ken Marshall painting on the cover. Yeah, it's, it could um, be the only kind of, two-tone painting he's ever done. Everything else has been in full color, I think. Yeah, um, I love the skull in the background, and it's just really unique. Um, yes. Uh, of course, I think it was done way before the discovery, wasn't it? Or oh yes, it? it's like 1980. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, so that's just such a cool book. Um, very cool. Um, and you were so nice to share that photo, which will um, appear in the newsletter um, okay. this month. Should I ever get it done? Um, <laughs> but anywho, um, I keep giving my, her things to add. It's my fault. <laughs> um, my um, so my first like little mini question is: since we're talking about books, and this is the book club chat, um, do you have a favorite uh, Titanic book that you didn't write? Yeah, um, at this oh, point, I'd have to say yeah. it's. George Behe's Onboard RMS Titanic. Yeah. It's a collection of the Titanic disaster as described by those who were there. Awesome. Okay, I have that one too. Um, very good. Good to know. Um, and then, of course, this is the leather bound um, copy that we were talking about earlier. If anybody yeah. was on the chat oh, earlier, that's beautiful. This is the leather bound copy of Don's book. We all drool um, about this in the book club. <laughs> um, it, it's just awesome. I just love this. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, so my last little mini question, um, my favorite part of the wreck, I love the passengers and I love the, um, their stories, but I think that a lot of their stories can be told from the artifacts um, that are found uh, at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and um, I think that they tell the story and then we kind of tell a story ourselves with the things that we collect um, to remind us of Titanic. So uh, Mr. Lynch, what is your favorite piece of memorabilia that you have at home? Ooh. Um, you know, part of me doesn't want to say, I don't want to be breaking into the house. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, so, Don, Don lives like somewhere in New Jersey, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, look for me when you're on the East Coast. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, it's, I, I, in some ways, because it's hard to say it's my favorite thing, um, but I do have things that belong to Edwina McKenzie. And what I love about them is the story because I literally fished them out of the trash. Um, when she died, her niece was throwing things away, including the diary she started when she got off the Carpathia. The very first entry describes that, um, you know, a list, a handwritten list of the things that she had lost that I guess she probably used when she submitted her claim. Um, and, you know, a few other little things like that. I mean, not just from that, but from other voyages on other ships. And pretty much, you know, it, literally it came out of the garbage. And so I think in some ways, those are some of my favorite things in my collection. I don't have a huge collection. I've never, I collected information more than things, um, but th that would be right up there. Oh, that's awesome. awesome. Thank you. I'm gonna highlight Sarah here because she, had put a comment here, but I don't know if you can read the comment. This is Sarah and Sarah wrote, such a pleasure and honor to see you. We met at the THS Boston convention in 2016 and I treasure your book, which you, and I think she meant Ken, she said Don, sorry. My Crime and Survivors, maybe she can show that. Hey. Um, Uh-oh, I don't know why I can't. Sarah, Thank I'm gonna you. unmute you. I'm gonna mute you in case you wanna say anything. I can't read the rest of your comment here. Okay. Uh, I just I just love to thank you for all of the work that you've done. Um, I I wrote a piece of fiction about the Titanic. Oh. And it could not have been done without your work. Um, oh, thank you. You're in the acknowledgements. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, 
like um, to send you a copy of the book, by the way, if you like. Oh, it sounds very interesting. She's very descriptive in her reading. Oh, nice. She did a little reading reading for us over the anniversary. Wait, let's take it back over to uh, Sarah. Show your book again for everybody. She had, she had a great event over the anniversary, Don, where we all joined in and she had a hat party and everybody talked about how to decorate. Oh, nice. <laughs> <Wonderful. hat. laughs> it was really a lot of fun. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, is there anybody else that wants to raise their hand? Just wave your hands around. I'll look for you. In the meantime, Tyler said, I'm sorry, Don. My phone kicked me out of the app while giving you an answer. My phone is very cheap. But whatever it was, you said, thank you. Oh, good, good. <laughs> sorry, Tyler. Um, I'll, get, I'll do a little, let's see. Can you see everyone this way, Don, if I open it up? This is all your... Fan, remaining fans there's still 25 yeah. people in here i just see the the uh, like probably could scroll oh okay i think there's different ways to do this yeah thing. yeah i can scroll across and see people people are waving to you oh my gosh i really appreciate you um giving us this time and yeah my pleasure i've enjoyed this thank you so much thank you so much, you so much. we love your book we love you everybody is um really this was really like the highlight of our month <laughs> helping us all through the you. shutdown we wish you well and your family and we hope everybody yeah. stays healthy and well thank you and i hope everybody stays well during this crisis that uh, you know we'll all get through this yeah. all right i'm going to do a quick unmute if everybody <clears throat> wants to anybody wants to just speak up that's been too nervous thank you so much don thank yeah you thank, you, so dawn. thank you dawn thank you dawn. Thank you so much, dawn. Oh, thank you it's thank a you. titanic honor thank you very much for expressing your inner doubt turmoil and awkwardness Please. Who's that talking? Who was that? Somebody. Yeah, it was the pleasure. Oh, maybe <laughs> It's yeah. been a pleasure, Don, and we appreciate it. We appreciate Thank you, Will, and truly do. Thank it's you. Just... Thanks, Thanks yeah. for sharing yeah. your time with us, Don. I appreciate it's... it. Thanks. Yes, thank, thank you, you so much. It's valued. Thank you for your time. We greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, this is the, this is the part honor. where I'm supposed to show my book, but I just have this in the house. So <laughs> Wait, who's that? Alex? Yeah, I have this model. I don't here, have my me, book. I had to here, put me, that um, in storage. Do I need to shine oh. on you? Oh, here we go. You, you know, oh, there you go. Yeah. I had I would have my book, but I put that in storage unit because I'm not exactly in a big house right now. <laughs> so I know it's I, I can promise you it is very safe. I packaged the hell out of it along with other Titanic books and stuff like <laughs> that. Oh, good, good. So <laughs> no, trust me, unless I die, that is not going anywhere. Uh, <laughs> <good>. <laughs> awesome. Wow. Well, this was yeah, so I'm, great. And as you guys know, Don's going to be in our next newsletter again. Awesome. We're not sure people saw it, you know, the first time. We were just kind of starting out. We were just a baby newsletter. You're just picking your footing, eh? Yep. And I know Don will be more, probably more than happy to take people to Hollywood Forever with them. So, Walter Clark, Bob William. Well, I get a great tour of Hollywood Cemetery. <laughs> you, got, you got plenty of celebrity, other celebrities to visit. Uh, yeah. If Tim Curry asks you whatever happened to Faye Ray, I can show you whatever happened to Faye Ray. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, Tim Curry, why yep. does that sound familiar? All right, we're going to do a live stream with Don and find out what happened to Faye Ray next. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and a quick reminder, if you're at Hollywood Forever Cemetery, in addition to Walter Clark's mausoleum, Clifton Webb, who played Walter Sturges in 1953, Titanic, is buried there, too. And Mrs. Kenyon's mother is buried there. One of the Titanic survivors' mother is buried at Hollywood Forever. Oh, wow. And, and just for everybody, that Fay Ray and Tim Curry, uh, comment if you haven't seen rocky horror picture show um, <laughs> and, uh, you wouldn't Has understand it seen rocky horror picture show. raise your hand if you haven't seen it people <laughs> guilty i'm guilty sorry feel free to talk to me for that you got lots of free time now yeah, oh, yeah, definitely right. seen it. even when the lockdown's over i still got plenty since i'm still flipping <laughs> work all right dad i just gotta point this out here i'm gonna point the camera at Jorge. 
Somebody um has a lot of noise. Jorge here. He asked um he asked uh Ken Marshall had put a photo. Somebody I would Richard, can you mute? Okay. Um somebody had um or Ken Marshall had put out a picture of the last ship, you know, the last known photo of Titanic. <laughs> and our our dear friend Jorge here said that is not true. And it started a great um, conversation with Ken and Jorge. I didn't know if you wanted to share a little of that, Jorge. Yeah, I just uh, I just called uh, Ken out uh, about the last picture of Titanic that was supposed to be uh, taken sometime in the day she left uh, Queenstown and she and I got the answer from Brian who is the administrator of the page and he's he told me I'm going to ask Ken what uh, his opinion and he wrote me right away and I got a long answer uh, Don you will receive the issue the newsletter of this month okay. with the full uh, script and with a full answer from Ken, I think a little bit edited, but it's, uh, you will be surprised that the picture I was trying to uh, defend was the incorrect. So I know and I respect Ken's word, and I think this, he is the expert. So now his photo is the last one. Okay. <laughs> but I wanted to point Jorge out for you so you could see. Um, I Thank can't. you. Because when I first saw that Jorge said that, I, he's like, it was that Ken. And I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> and, when it ended up, and when you see Ken's answer, it was very descriptive. It was about sunlight and waves and, you know, really. Well, you know, Ken that will be in the newsletter lighting. too. <laughs> you know, when, when Ken looks at something, he sees lighting. You know, we see, you know, size and shape and color or whatever. Ken sees lighting. You know, that's the first thing. It's like he just, mm -hmm. part of his vision is where the lighting is coming from. Mm. The amount of details descriptive in his post is amazing. Yes. Really beautiful. I'm also yes. I don't I don't know if Adrian, are you here? I'm gonna I'm gonna bring Adrian up here. Adrian I'm gonna take my last seconds to think uh, Oh that. good, go ahead. <laughs> I didn't mean to cut you off or hey. No, don't worry, it's fine. Uh, I, I just wanted to point um, Adrian here. He is working on a project to res um, repair the Titanic Lighthouse in New York City. Wonderful. So I just wanted to point him out. Good. He's been do he's on Instagram and he's been interviewing people and really um, he's got Helen Benziger on board because her um, great grandmother Margaret was very instrumental in getting that lighthouse put in. Um, but Jorge, did you want to say something else? I feel bad I cut you off. <laughs> no, just thank you, Don, for everything you you have done for the community, for the society, and for everything we know now. Thank you, and somehow, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And you're a very kind, very nice person. I have oh, to thank you. Admit. <laughs> I never you know, tire of hearing that. You know, you know, no, no, you know how hard you know how hard it is to get in touch with some of these people that are actually in the spotlight right now. Uh -huh. So I'm really thankful. Oh, great, great! I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Jorge's writing all the way in from Chile. He's our member. Chile. From Chile. Nice. <laughs> I think, did everybody get a chance? Adriana, I want to do a shout out to you because you yes. are my friend that I met at, at the THS convention. I'm gonna 2012, pass. I think. Yes, we had oh. such a great time. It was so nice to see you here. And I was so happy. Like I've been meaning to look at my events and I haven't done it. And literally a few hours ago, I was like, I better do that. And I'm so happy I did because like this has been the highlight of the week. Uh, <laughs> yay. I'm so glad it's we got a lot of fun. Thank you. It was a great way to get everyone together, you know, especially if we can't meet at a convention. Absolutely. <laughs> I love this. This is so much fun. Uh, I just, I, I'm putting people on the spot now. Sorry. <laughs> Anybody else? What about me? you? Me? Alicia? Who's saying I have Oh, Joanna, yes. Here we go. Let me move up to Joanna. Here. I just can't say enough. Um, Mr. Lynch, I just can't thank you enough for doing this. Um, this is just amazing. Um, I have one last question. Okay. Um, the wreck is, you know, so fascinating to me. Um, and it's been in the news recently, I'm sure you're aware. Um, if you were invited, would you go on another expedition? 
Yeah, well, depending upon who invites me. <laughs> uh, so I was comfortable that it was safe. Um, yes, I would. I, I will say, you know, that 2001 expedition in some ways was the highlight of my life. You know, I just, um, to be having studied the Titanic all those years and actually get to go down to it, see it, everything, explore it, you know, be part of that where we got to see the inside for the first time. And, you know, I, I'd never be able to recapture that, but I would go again. And I did in 2005, we went back out, even though I didn't get to go back down to the ship. But yes, I, I would um, participate in another expedition if it was the right one. Well, I've heard that some areas um, have opened up recently or fairly recently because of the uh, further decay. So I, I hope that they, they would go back. Um, and I hope they invite you because I think you're like the best historian and you're amazing in the documentaries that you're in. I enjoy those so much. So I hope that you are part of you know future expeditions if they have them. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Speaking of expeditions, are there any more planned? I am not aware of any. I know they just had one, what, last year um, that they haven't released very much footage of. But you know, it does show, as we expected, you know, more opening up of the officers' quarters, things like that. Um, but you know, I don't know of anything planned anytime soon. Yeah, I don't think the Thank mirrors you. are even in service right now, and I think the uh, um, Nautil is uh, uh, down too. So uh, the only one that's available was that one that went uh, last year. Yeah, uh, that's my understanding. People. Also, yeah. Now. I just, oh, I just wanted, okay. I just wanted to, sorry, I just wanted to ask Don. As a journalist, I know we we tend to ask questions that other people are a little scared of asking. What okay. are your, yeah, what are your thoughts um, on the recent controversial of the recovery of the um, Marconi wireless machine? I, I don't think it's worth bringing up because you know, you basically you have to go in and tamper with the wreck and I'm against tampering with the wreck. I think it should just be left down there. Oh, Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah. I've been taken yeah. from there as it is, if you ask me, like, because um, I've seen the artifacts myself too. Um, not, where was this, Melbourne 2010, they had an artifact exhibition. They had like all the uh, items you would have seen in Vegas or wherever displayed. They had the yes. big piece. They had like that grand staircase recreation. They had, you know, <laughs> Um, that big model they have there and um, some personal belongings. I kind of, God, I was 14 then. <laughs> yeah, that was a while ago, but I still remember that well. It was, yes. it was a, it yeah. was a lovely place. And I thought, yeah, they, I still remember just looking at them thinking, you know, they don't need any more to bring up any more, excuse me. Yeah. I, I, we, we know what that radio was. We know how it was built. We know it has put together. Um, I'm a, an amateur radio operator, by the way, and I study Titanic's radio and all that uh, extra class uh, here in Colorado. But, um, I, you know, we know what that was. We know what it looked like. We know how it all put together. So, yeah, I completely agree. We don't need to uh, uh, tamper with the wreck and... Um, yeah. And, and bring it bring anything up i mean we can yeah. make a recreation of it and people will still get the sense of what the history was well i know someone said that it's the titanic's voice but i don't think no matter how much you try to restore it you're going to be able to replicate what it sounded mm -hmm. like in 1912. Right, exactly. yeah yeah oh yeah. ryan i saw you had your hand up me, me i was always afraid they'd try to rip the wreck apart oh I'm on. Did you have your hand? <laughs> Sorry. I did. I did. No, I was just wanting to say before, obviously, this all closes up. I just looked at the time and noticed that you've more or less give us double the time that we thought we were going to get with you. I just wanted to say thank you very much for your time. It's been an honor and an absolute privilege to speak to you and just listen to you this evening. It's been amazing. Yeah, thank you very much. I know I'm watching my battery level, and if it's getting low, I yeah. guess it's been about two hours. <laughs> All right, we better let you go. <laughs> yeah. We are just so grateful. Yeah, well, thank and you. I've enjoyed this That's very well. much. Thank you, everybody, thank and I've enjoyed you. the questions. I've enjoyed meeting you and seeing some of you again. This has been really, really thank fun. You. I salute you, Don. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Don. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Don. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Take care, everybody. And you, you take care, care too. All right. Stay safe. Bye, guys. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye. See you, man. Bye, Dom. Let's see if we all know how to get out of here now. <laughs> <Good> <laughs> Shouldn't be that hot. Trapped um... in the zone. <laughs>
Oh, whose oh, voice was that, cool. Eric? I, 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 I thought I heard a, I thought I heard like a Boston accent. Hod. There's the man in the high yeah, That's me. Somebody, man, somebody so. said Hod. Who was that? I can swear I keep Who hearing probably the Game Boy on. Sounds like that, eh? Actually, nice dialogue. It, does, it there, sounds like someone's way. switching on a fucking Game Boy, doesn't it? The... <laughs> yes, even <laughs> I'm old <laughs> enough to. I grew up with that a lot of Game Boy. You guys didn't play it, but I got the wicked special Boston accent. Oh, yeah. uh, you guys are all welcome to come to oh, our yeah. party at the Titanic Friends Group. I don't know if well, everybody here. How do we get there? I'm, I'm, I'm Irish. I'm already it's also on I'm Zoom. Party, you know what <laughs> how do I? Maybe I can put the link right in here in the chat. Yes, please. Yeah, we're already we'll partying. We'll because we're right. like, we're gonna have a dress the up. So you have to dress up if you we'll have like a show and tell. <laughs> I need to take like a ten-minute break, but I would like to be in the party. Yeah, go take a break. I'm going to put the link up. I'll put the okay. link up maybe right. in the, here in the chat. I'll... Yeah, put the link up and I'll join in a few moments. I just feel okay. like... I just see everybody's comment on my Dalek now. Yeah, you've got a nice Dalek. I just see the little oh, Titanic. I, 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 I see you got Dalek. Dalek. Yeah, it's actually a remote. It's actually a TV remote. Like, I could literally turn off any TV in the world with this. I used wow. to have the Mark Smith TV that's remote awesome. one. Oh, yeah, that's, that's nice. Only, that's only one of them. I have five of them. Nice, bro. You have five of them. I have, well, I like the think full I... size ones. Yes, I have hundreds of like ones from like that size up to that size, and then I have five big ones. Nice. He's not kidding. Oh, did I have a one in a lightsaber. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I have a lightsaber as well. Mm. Did you? Uh, uh, I want one. Video, I, I don't want it to have the thing that you shine the light up through. I want the actual what illuminated the thing. Oh, those, those ones, those ones. <laughs> one. Nice Star Wars top there, George. <laughs> yeah. I mean, only top I'm wearing is the one I got from Titanic Belfast three years ago. That was... Love you, Lucas! I'm just going to turn around and say it now. Like, coming from someone from Belfast, Titanic Belfast is a massive disappointment. Just put it out there. That's oh, fine. Guys. That's your opinion. I when still you want guys, to While you're here, um, we'll <laughs> talk. When you get into the friends chat, we'll talk about it. But Anka, is she still here? She has a friend that's going to take us around Belfast next Sunday. So nice. She's a boss, mate. Keep your eye uh, out. We'll be telling you about that. We just are enjoying the Zoom so mm, much. And oh, I want to work other. there one day. Did I? Wouldn't, wouldn't mind being a tour guide there. Oh, I know. <laughs> Did I hear something about um, Ken being on one of these? We, we, we would love for him to. That We're would be. Ron had such a good time. He'll um, share it with his friends. Yeah, that would be amazing. I... That... Yeah. <laughs> I love his work. My gosh. I got, I got so one beautiful. of the, uh, I got a giant print in, downstairs, the cliche. It's like 36 by 30 in my living room of yeah. Titanic tied up at Southampton. Oh, wow. We want to see that, Eric. Bring it to the show and tell. <laughs> Hi, Eric. I didn't even see you here. I'm here. Been here the whole time. Thank uh, you for inviting me. It was hard for me to try to find everybody. Is like, uh, When's well, the show can, and tell? So come on. I'm, I I can't start that meeting until I start this one. But do you see, I just put, oh, Anka's muted. How did Anka get muted? She just wrote, Whoops. I'm muted. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. How'd you get muted? I, even she doesn't know okay it's, there we it's go it's just one of those it's one of those things i just put it in the did you guys see the code here um i put it yeah. in the little thing I oh joe all... yes are you getting your violin I, I missed it last time yeah you always want to hear my mirror maybe later I, I, I missed it last time i want to hear this <laughs> i'm actually taking <laughs> lessons now because i somebody saw me and she's like hey did you learn a violin teacher? Like, yeah. I'm considering getting a violin just uh, to learn that near thy God to thee, and that's it. That's yeah. it. That's all. That's I can it. share my notes with you and everything because oh. I I found the easiest way Drink to a follow. Drink a little bit more, Ryan. Drink a little bit. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's get this. Uh, let's get this wrapped up. And yeah, get if we can close this one, room. I can open the other meeting. But let's um, so we fill our glasses first. Send me yeah. a private <laughs> message and I'll send you the information too for the other chat. People. There's a few there's a few drunks on this me on this meeting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Plus, so I'm so I'm I'm should should I, my should I turn this off of Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna yeah. turn off of Facebook.